turning your Bibles this evening to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11 is where we're going to be. Uh, we're down to verse 13, uh, but I would like to catch us back up. Uh, and so I'm going to read verses 5 to 12. And then once I'm done verse 12, I'll get you guys to catch into the reading. Uh, Naomi can get 13 and 14, Tammy 15 and 16, and Bill 17, 18, and 19. But I'm going to start back at verse 5. Also the king of the south shall become strong, as well as one of his princes, and he shall gain power over him and have dominion. His dominion shall be a great dominion. And at the end of some years they shall join forces, for the daughter of the king of the south shall go to the king of the north to make an agreement, but she shall not retain, power of, retain the power of her authority, and neither he nor his authority shall stand, but she shall be given up with those who brought her, and with him who begot her, and with those who strengthened her in those times. But from the branch of her roots, one shall arise in his place who shall come with an army into the fortress of the king of the north, and deal with them and prevail. And he shall also carry away their gods captive to Egypt with their princes and their precious articles of silver and gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. Also, the king of the north shall come to the king of the south, but shall return to his own land. However, his son shall stir up strife and assemble a multitude of great forces, and one shall certainly, cer certainly come and, over, and overwhelm and pass through. Then he shall return to his fortress and stir up strife. And the king of the south will be moved with rage and go out and fight with him with the king of the north who shall muster a great multitude, but multitude shall be given into the hand of his enemy. When he has taken away the multitude, his heart will be lifted up, and he will cast down tens of thousands, but he will not prevail. For the king of the north shall again be the multitude greater than the first, and after seven years he shall come on with great army and abundant supplies. In those times many shall rise against the king of the south, the violence among your own people shall lift themselves up in order to fulfill the vision, but they shall fail. For the king of the north shall come and go to sleep, and the king of the north shall come and go to sleep, and the voice of the south shall not withstand him. Even his fierce troops shall have no strength to resist him. For he who comes against him shall do according to his own coast, and no one shall stand against him. He shall stand in the glorious land. He will set his face upon the power of the whole kingdom, bringing with him the souls of his feet, which he will put into a cup. He will also give him the daughter of Lena to Rina, but she will not take the stand for him or be on his side. Then he will turn his face to the coastman to capture men, but the commander will put the stop to his stand against him. Moreover, he will repay him for his sin. So he will turn his face towards the torture of his own men, and he will stumble and fall and be found no more. Okay. If you've ever heard premillennialists talk, they love to come to chapter 11 and start speculating on the kingdom, the king of the north, and the king of the south. I have heard. European Union described as the king of the north, Russia described as the king of the north, China described as the king of the north, all coming towards Jerusalem, and they'll tie in the battle of Armageddon in the book of Revelation. They'll tie in the tribulation times in Matthew 24. And they will all come along and say, see, this is what Daniel is talking about. We'll talk about the abomination of desolation a little later on in the chapter. But we've jumped too far ahead in history. Going back to verse 4, verse 3 and 4, we talk about Alexander the Great and the Greek kingdom and how that was going to be divided. Well, you don't immediately jump to Rome. 
if you're going to do that. The kingdom was divided into four parts, and the two parts that we're talking about are the king of the north, which would be the Seleucids, and the king of the south, which would be the Ptolemies. If you read history, even if you just read a cursory uh, 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 look at history, and you look at the Seleucid Empire, you know that the Seleucid Empire and the Ptolemaic Empire in Egypt constantly battled back and forth. And it was just a power struggle as to who had power. Sometimes the Seleucids had the upper hand, sometimes the Ptolemies had the upper hand. Eventually, you would get uh, them being weakened by the, the Armenians, uh, the, the kingdoms to the east of them, and then you come to Pompeii, uh, the commander, not city, commander of Pompeii, who would be the one under the Romans who would finally put an end to this, and the, that's when Rome would really take over, looking, uh, uh, ruling over the Pal Palestine, and then we get to the time of Jesus, uh, not too long after that. But, when we go back to Daniel 11, we're talking about the king of the south, king of the north, let's not come along and make it today. Let's remember Daniel was prophesying to a king, or to, to, he was prophesying about the days after the Greek Empire. And so, coming to verse 13, we have the king of the north. He comes again. He's coming again with a bigger army, more money, and many other violent forces will fight against the king of the south, and they'll ally themselves against the king of the north. Again, we're, we're getting that power struggle. What will, what will the king of the north do in verses 15 and 16? Okay, so he's going to set a siege and take the fortified cities. Well, the king of the south, what will he do? He'll be able to stop it. So, again, we're having the king of the north. He's going to prevail for a time. And the king of the north will take from the south and stand in the glorious land. What do you suppose the glorious land is? We're coming from Daniel's point of view, and an angel from heaven is revealing this to him. Yeah. Specifically, the land of the Jews, what we call the land of Israel. And the glorious land, um, uh, which glorious land will be destroyed? And so we have this glorious land here described. And, and the, so the king of the north is going to take from the king of the south, and he's going to stand there. Then verses 17 and 19, the king of the north, which again, Seleucids, he's going to use force, the force of his kingdom, to corrupt the daughters of women. What do you suppose that's, that's indicating? It's going to corrupt the daughters of women. Yeah. So you think about, you go back to Genesis chapter 6, just before the flood. We read of a moral decline. The, the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and, and sin just went rampant. That's what I'm thinking about here. Every time you have departures from God, you have new powers come into power, and, and they become arrogant of themselves, you typically have a drop in morality. We're seeing it today. It's not that what we're seeing today is vastly worse than at other times. It's just we have television. We have the Internet. We can see it. And it might seem like it's worse than before, and perhaps it is worse than before, but it's uh, mankind's goes up and down, up and down, and up and down. You have moral decline, you have destruction, and then you might have a period where it's not so bad. And then you have a rise and it goes back up and down. Think of judges in Israel. Israel had that cycle where they'd go off into idolatry, they'd face oppression, 
they'd repent and cry out to God, gain deliverance, and go and do it all over again. And so we have here the 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 Seleucid Empire is going to is going to uh, bring in some lower moral standards. He's going to take the Isles, which is off these some of the islands. But another prince in verse um, in verse I think it's eighteen. Uh, yeah, but a ruler shall bring the reproach against them to an end. Notice here that ruler, or some versions might say prince, not the king of the south, not the king of the north. And it appears that perhaps this is the Romans in its early in its early state <coughs> going to challenge the Seleucids. Now, they're, they're, the Seleucids, as, they, as their power declined, and it de didn't decline over a period of years, it declined over a couple centuries, uh, they would get challenged from other countries that, uh, that they originally ruled over. And so this prince here is going to challenge the king of the north, who will turn to fight in his own land, but he shall fall and die. And so we see this power struggle coming here. King of the North, King of the South. There's going to be some others coming against sort of the King of the North. And we get this power struggle. Again, when we had said about Dan, the book of Daniel, uh, coming along and people saying, well, it's easy to write about history when you've already, when it's already happened. This prophecy goes much further than simply the Seleucid Empire. A lot of people think Daniel might have been written around the time of the Maccabees, around the turn of the second, well, the turn of the, when the third century becomes the second century, because we're coming backwards. And, and they say, well, Daniel's prophecies aren't really prophecies because the, the, uh, Medes and the Persians have already fallen, Alexander the Greek, uh, Greeks already fallen. And whoever wrote Daniel wrote in the time of the Seleucids, and so really not we're not going to uh, we're not really not talking about much. Now do remember the statue of Daniel didn't end with the Greeks; it talked about another kingdom. And this chapter is not going to end with the Greeks either. This chapter will pertain in the end to the time of the Romans and the destruction of Jerusalem by Rome, and the way we know that is because Jesus says so. Uh, and so. And so we can have confidence that not only Daniel wrote this, we can have confidence in that, but that these prophecies are, uh, are true, and they actually are prophecies, and not just a retelling of history. My point always is when people come along with that, why didn't Daniel, or whoever wrote Daniel, they, in their opinion, just say the Seleucids and the Ptolemies? Why did he speak in the kingdoms of the north and the kingdoms of the south? He identified Babylon. He identified Greece. He identified the Medes and the Persians. Why is he so big here if he is living at this time? Whoever's writing this is living at this time. And I can't explain that. And I don't believe others can either. That uh, when when we do have prophecy, sometimes we're told, oftentimes we're not. Greece wasn't told in the days of Nebuchadnezzar. Greece wasn't told to Nebuchadnezzar. Medes and the Persians weren't really revealed to Nebuchadnezzar either, because it didn't concern him. Daniel only received uh, information about the Greeks very late in his life. And because of a vision, an angel came and appeared to him and said, well, God's going to reveal this to you. But even Daniel didn't even need to know that. But we, we have this power struggle. King of the north, king of the south. Let's continue on with it. 320 to 28. We'll do, Na uh, we'll do Henry 20 and 21. Naomi 22, 23. Tammy, 24, 25, and Bill can get 26, 27, and 28. 
Gershon writes in his place one of the important factors in the glorious kingdom. But within a few days, he shall be destroyed, and not a young angel or a crowd. And in his place shall arise a wild person to whom we are not given the honor of royalty. But we shall come in peaceful, peaceful and see the kingdom by Egypt. And he shall be utterly populated for him and broken, even the prince of the covenant. And from the time of the alliance made with him, he shall act deceitfully, and shall become small, strong with a small people. He shall enter peacefully, even into the earthly place of the prophet. And he shall put the fathers of Malcolm, nor the forefathers. He shall disperse among them the plunder, oil, and riches. And he shall devise his plans against the but only for a time. He shall stir up his power and prepare it against the king of his house with a great army. And the king of his house shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. But he shall not stand, for they shall divide the land to him. And he uses great speed, will destroy him and his army, will overthrow him, and then he will fall down his land. But to both kings, their hearts will be in some kind of evil. They will speak lies to each other at the same table, but it will not succeed. For the end is still to come, as we are trying to find. Then he will return to his land with much plunder, but his heart will be set against the Holy Covenant, and he will take our sin and then return to his own land. Okay. Who's the king of the north going to be succeeded by? In verse 20. Some of them opposes high taxes. We're not going to speculate as to who that is. But someone... Is the king of the north is going to be succeeded by a man who's going to lay heavy taxes? Is this man going to live long? No, Henry says. But within a few days he shall be destroyed, but not in anger or in battle. I think there's a typo on that page. He's not going to live long. He's not going to be in power long. And in his place, who's going to uh, who's going to arise there? Not a righteous person, a vile person, a less honorable person. He's going to gain the, gain the kingdom at a time of peace. How's he going to gain the kingdom? By intrigue, by flattery and intrigue. He's going to he's going to flatter the people he's gonna get. He's probably a charismatic type person. And he's gonna he's gonna worm his way in through nice words. We have politicians today that try to do that. They try to gain power not by telling you the truth. If they told you the truth, you wouldn't vote for them. Instead, they'll sound nice, they'll promise the world. And people will vote for them. Well, here, there's no voting going on here, but the kings, uh, men act the same way. Want power? Sometimes you take it by force. But if you want to sustain power, maybe you take it by just uh, convincing the people and those in power that you belong there. So a new king's going to rise, not going to be honorable. Now, in verse 22, we have... His opponents are going to be large, uh, his opponents' large forces are going to be swept away from before him as in a flood. So there's going to be a, a battle. It says, with the force of a flood, they shall be swept away from before him and be broken, and also the prince of the covenant. So we're going to have his enemies destroyed, including the prince of the covenant. He's going to use alliances to capture the kingdom with a small force. In other words, he really shouldn't be king. You would, you would think, okay, how did this guy become king? Well, he did it this way. 
In a time of peace and security, he's going to do things his fathers never did before. He's going to dis he will distribute to his forces all of the plunder and the riches. In other words, he's going to buy off people and, and make people feel comfortable. It's a time of relative peace. He shall defeat, in verse 24, all the strongholds or the opposing forces. But even he is only going to rule for a short period of time. Who is going to come in verse 25? King of the South. We have the King of the South, the King of the... Well, what, what did my dad say here? Uh, so he shall stir up his power. Remember, we, I think we're in the North, if, if I keep remembering right. King of the North, this king is the King of the North. He's replaced the former king of the north, but he's still the king of the north. He's going to come against the Ptolemies, the king of the south. The king of the south is going to be stirred up, who will rise in full, full of anger, but be defeated because of his strength, schemes and alliances. The king of the south is going to be stirred up into battle with a very great mighty army, but he'll not stand for the devised plans against him. Those that have been benefited of the king of the south will help destroy him, and his army will flow away or be killed. These two kings will then tell lies to each other and make agreements that don't work because their kingdoms are going to be ending soon. The end is to come. God will that the end would come. Remember Daniel's statue, the, the, the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. The Seleucids and the Ptolemies were not that third kingdom. They were the remnants of that third kingdom. They were not the fourth kingdom either. History, history shows that the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, over time, it just decayed away. And the Romans took over. The king of the north is going to go back to his home, own land for a while with great riches. But his heart is going to be against God's holy covenant. Uh, he's against God. The Seleucids are not are not um, standing for God, even though they they might be ruling over Israel. Uh, remember the the people of Israel have returned to the land. The temple is there in Jerusalem, uh, but there's no king in Israel. Ruling, they are still being ruled over by foreign powers. Any comments up to this point? This is more prophecy, uh, more uh, maybe a little bit more of a monologue because we're not dealing with really principles. But any comments? Move on. Let's read verses 29 to 39. We'll do three verses this time. We'll come and start with Henry. 29, 30, and 31 for Henry, 32, 33, and 34 Naomi, 35, 36, 37 for Tammy, and Bill can get the short straw this time with 38 and 39. At the point of time, he shall return and it will work so. Uh, he shall not have been like to the former of the devil. For the sheep upon this tempers shall come against him. Therefore, he shall not, he shall be grieved. Burning weight against the holy power and the death. So he shall return and show regard for those who conceit the holy power. And the first years it shall be mastered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary of Then they shall take away the daily sacrifice and face their abomination of the desolation. He shall seduce and flatter those who violate the covenant, that the people who know the law should stand firm and take action. And the wise of the people shall make many understand, though for some days they shall stumble by sword and pain, by captivity and plunder. When they stumble, they shall receive a little help, and many shall join themselves to them with flattery. Uh, 35. Yeah. Himself, 
So we have the king of the north, the king of the south. King of the north is going to come back against the south again, just like he's always done. What's going to happen this time? In verse 29. And 30. It's not going to end up the same way. It, the king of the north is used to coming to the king of the south and having his way with him. And the king of the south will come up usually and, 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 and fight back. Not going to be the same. Ships from Cyprus and Crete, in other words, the west, far beyond. By this time, we're talking, even though Cyprus and Crete we think of as being the Greeks, and they were, but by the time of the Seleucids, the fall of the Seleucid and Ptolemaic empires, we're talking about the Romans here. He's going to leave the south and go with anger. Uh, he's going to come against him. He shall leave the south and go with anger against the Holy Covenant, God's eternal plan. And then we're dealing with Rome. Then we're skipping ahead a little bit. Rome's going to deal with the Seleucids. But then what? Then where is God's plan going to go? Well, in verse 30 and 31, he's... The, the Romans are going to make a little dis, little distinction, not a little, little distinction, between the Jews and those who would look like Jews after Jesus' time, who would be Christians. Verse 31 says that he's going to defile the sanctuary fortress, take away the daily sacrifices, and place there the abomination of desolation. Now, that happened at one time before Jesus in the days of the Maccabees. But we're not talking about the days of the Maccabees here. We're talking later than that. Jesus refers to this passage in Matthew chapter 24. And I'd like us to go there. Matthew chapter 24 and get verse 15. This is how we can be certain that we're talking about the Roman destruction of Jerusalem. I'm going to get verse 15. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Jesus refers to this abomination of desolation. This is not talking about uh, of an abomination before the Romans, this is talking about the abomination of desolation by the Romans. The Romans are going to come and destroy Jerusalem. They're going to turn on Christians throughout the empire. And verse 31 says, He shall accept those who break the Holy Covenant. He shall stop the sacrifices in the temple. He will make the place an abomination. He will use flattery to corrupt the people from the covenant. But the people that truly know God who are Christians, shall not be deceived by him or yield in their faith to him. Remember, the book of Revelation deals a lot with this Roman deification and this Roman persecution that we're going to get. Uh, and Christians will die. But, uh, but uh, the Romans will kill Christians. Uh, but Christians generally don't... don't um, uh, don't allow them to live. Many of God's people are going to perish by the sword and in flame and in captivity. Executions. If you've ever heard of the gladiators, uh, they, they were going to be fed to the lions. Like as far as it's going to be sport, they're going to be made candles and be burned. Verse 34 says, When the saints fall, some will find mercy. Others will leave the faith in hypocrisy following the flatterers. 
but some will fall and perish at this time to keep their purity until the time of the end of the abomination. Of course, this is again talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. As he does all the preceding things, the king of the north, this time the king of the north is Rome, because remember he has destroyed the former king of the north. King of the north here is going to try to make himself a god and speak against the true god. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 to 12 deals with this. I'm not going to take too much of Phil's thunder when he gets there uh, in, in our study of 2 Thessalonians. But there is talk of that strong delusion. And God's going to provide that. And as he does with all, all the preceding things, the king of the north is going to try to make himself a god. This evil will continue to succeed until the end of the abomination. The king will show no respect for man. The parents, mothers, gods, or or God himself. He's going to demand people honor him as God. And this is why Christians would be killed. The Romans trusted in themselves. The God of force. In other words, they trusted in their own strength and their own wealth. He's going to fight against all other fortresses. He's going to honor those who acknowledge him and make them prosperous and wealthy. But, even he won't last forever. I wanted to get verses 40 and 40 to 45, but I don't think we're going to get that opportunity. There's just too much, too much there. Uh, I'm not going to rush it. Uh, I'll, I'll stick 40 to 45 in our pocket for next time. So we've covered a lot from chapter 11 tonight. It might, it might seem we, we've not done a lot of a lot of in-depth study as because we don't need to speculate a lot of things. This prophecy was given. We know it was fulfilled. We can see that from history. We don't have to identify uh, every king everywhere. Say, well, this one's this king, this one's that king. We can know what we can know. And for the things we can't know, then let's not speculate further. And so we will have the return of the king of the south and and what the king of the north is going to do to him i'm not a